Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today for the webinar which is on visual perception assessments, providing an overview of the DTVP3, the TVPS3, MVP T3 and VUE VMI visual perception tests. My name is Melinda Cooper, I'm the OT consultant for Pearson in Australia and New Zealand and I'll be presenting today's webinar. So the first one we're going to look at is the DTVP3 or the Developmental Test of Visual Perception and it's the third edition. So this is the most recent out of all the tests that we're going to look at today and it was published in 2013 so it's getting on a bit now, it's five years old. The authors, Hamel Pearson and Vores, none of them are occupational therapists. Um, in fact, none of the tests that we're looking at at all today have been authored by, authored by OTs. I always think it's worth mentioning that because we know that when we have tests that have been written by occupational therapists, occupational therapists, they do tend to have more of a functional flavour to them. These are all very much bottom-up uh, assessments. So the DTVP3 has a visual perception element and a visual motor element to it as well. The norms are from age 4 up to 12 years and 11 months and it takes 20 to 40 minutes to um, complete depending on the age of the child and the basal and the ceiling and those kinds of things. Of course being the third edition it is a revision of previous versions and usually each time you get a new version of a test you get a slight improvement um, or hopefully a lot of improvement between the versions and we'll talk about the differences between the DTVP2 and DTVP3 in just a second. I do find that I meet a lot of clinicians who are still using the DTVP2 and weren't aware that there is a third edition so if you are using the two I'll tell you what's new about the three in just a moment. As with all the other tests that we're talking about today as well, this is a, an American test standardised on over a thousand children in this particular edition. So the norms for this version of the test were collected in 2010 and 2011 and one of the things that they did was they extended the age range up, so now up to 12, 11, so basically taking us to the end of primary school in most cases. There's no floor and ceiling effects in composite scores, so the items have been supplemented with some easier and some more difficult items so that within that age range up to 12, 11, you can still assess a child who is functioning above average. There's also been an expanded review of psychometric properties and the authors really took a lot of care with this new version or the newer version of the DTVP3 to really try and hone the psychometric properties so that it became a more reliable and valid test. That's one of the universal difficulties that we have with visual perception assessments is, is their reliability. So as part of that review they actually ended up removing three of the subtests and unfortunately these are three of, well particularly the, the first two, three of the most widely used and yeah, widely relied on subtests. However, the position in space, spatial relations and visual motor speed subtests were removed because they weren't able to provide the level of reliability and validity that the authors were after in order to give the test overall the, the level of psychometric kind of validity and reliability that they were after. So unfortunately we don't have those spatial relationships type of items in this version of the test. That's just how it is unfortunately. So the components of the test, the manual and the picture book which is the one that has all the pictures in it that the child will look at, the response booklet which is the one that the child draws in, the examiner record booklet, there's a scoring transparency as well which you use for the copying tasks and the, the eye-hand coordination tasks. It all comes packaged in a box which looks quite nice but if you're anything like me and you take your tests with you to lots of different places, the box is kind of annoying to carry because there's no handle so I put mine in a bag. Just a little tip there. So let's talk about the subtests in the DTVP3. Subtest 1 is the eye-hand coordination one. So this is where we're looking at visual motor control. And so the child has to trace between the lines. As you can see they get more complex as you go through from a simple horizontal line. Then there is the option to score according to how far away they deviate from the center and then we get a more complex path. There's also some copying items and if you haven't, if you're not familiar with the DTVP3 but you know for example the VMI, you'll see there are some similarities there in that we have a shape to be copied and then a space underneath and you just simply ask the child to make one that looks the same. But you'll see that with as with the VMI, they do get more complex as they go through and we end up with some really quite complex drawings, more complex than what you get in the VMI. They also tend to jump more quickly through the developmental stages than the VMI does. 
So um, that's something to bear in mind, particularly if you're assessing a younger child um, who is likely to reach a ceiling quite quickly. Then we have our visual perception test. So the figure ground is pretty stock standard, finding a shape from beneath or from within a, an array of uh, competing shapes. Visual closure, so trying to find one that would look the same if it was complete. Form constancy, so finding the shape even though it has been altered in some way. And um, so then we have all those subtests and we then have to score it. So with the administration of the DTVP3, you administer all the eye-hand coordination items and the other ones, like the ones I've just shown you, reach a ceiling with three consecutive fails or scores of zero. You then get scaled scores and percentile ranks for each of these subtests and you can combine subtests to form composites. So we have a visual motor integration composite, motor reduced visual perception and general visual perception. And if we take a look at what the form looks like, it's been chopped off here on the left, but you can just see that it's pretty logical. The visual motor, into, uh, visual motor perception subtest consists of the eye hand and copying ones, so the ones with a motor component. Motor reduced is all of the other ones, and then the general is all of them together. You also get these descriptive terms at, at the bottom of the form that tell you, based on the score, how you would rank the child. So you can see they've worked off a mean of 10 and standard deviation of 2 for the scaled scores, and a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 10 for the composite index score. You can also calculate whether there's a difference or a marked difference in functioning between the motor and the non-motor aspects of the test, which is, I guess, interesting from a, an analysis point of view, how much motor might be playing a, a part in the child's difficulties or whether it is purely visual. So clinical uses of the DTVP3, um, obviously one of the purposes of it is to identify children with visual perception difficulties, but you can also use it to look at visual motor integration difficulties and to extent, determine the extent of these difficulties and how the child is related to their same age peers and having those standard scores and percentile ranks, you can see exactly how far away from the mean their performance is. You can use it as a retest measure. I wasn't able to find in the manual any specific recommendations about how long to wait before re-administering the DTVP3, but I would say probably as a minimum six months would be what I would recommend. It's suitable obviously for primary age children, so if you're working in with that age range, then this is a test that is uh, applicable to your client group. It's less appropriate for children who have no motor deficits, and that's clearly because there is a motor component, and so we know that if they already have motor difficulties, they're going to struggle on those. It's not really going to give us anything very helpful. So the strengths and weaknesses of the DTVB3, obviously um, you get the visual perception score with and without motor. The norms um, I've put here up to date, they are the most up to date out of the ones that we're talking about today, um, but they are getting on a bit now. And the DTVP3 has stronger psychometric properties than previous versions, and it, it's one of the stronger visual perception tests, certainly out of the ones that we're talking about today that are purely visual perception, which are the DTVP3, the MVPT3, and the TVPS3, the DTVP3 has the strongest psychometric properties out of all of those three. Weaknesses, obviously having that motor component could be a, an issue for some people who have known motor difficulties and so it's not that appropriate for them. The fact that we've lost our spatial aspects um, some people would see as a, a problem and there's also no visual memory or visual discrimination components. They talk about the fact that you need visual discrimination in order to do any of the other visual perception tasks. So you need for example good visual discrimination in order to do figure ground because you need to be able to perceive the same which is basically what discrimination subtest measure, finding one that looks the same. So the authors argue that you, all visual motor sorry, all visual perceptual tests, subtests, measure visual discrimination, um, but not having that memory component is a problem for some people. And I also find that the instructions for the DTVB3, there is a, a standard script to follow, and I find them quite wordy. So it's important to think about that if you're working with children who have receptive language difficulties or working memory difficulties who are going to struggle to understand the instructions or to be able to keep the instructions in mind as they're going through. So that's the DTVP3 in a nutshell. Now if we move on to the test of visual perceptual skills or the TVPS, 
third edition, again, third time it's been revised. So this was published in 2006, so seven years older than the DTVP3, and so now it is getting to be quite old, 12 years old. The author is Nancy Martin, who I believe is a psychologist, and this is a purely visual perceptual test, it doesn't have that motor component. The norms go a little bit higher than the DTVP3, so they start at age 4 and go up to 18 years, 11 months, so basically covering primary and secondary ages in this test. And it takes about 30 to 40 minutes, and again, that will depend on the age of the child and the abilities, because we do have basal and ceiling rules to follow with this test. Again, it's a revision of previous versions, so the, the one that most people know of is the TVPSR, so this is a, an update from that. And the standardisation was done in, again in the USA on 2008 children, so quite a good size sample for the age range that it covers. Components, again there's a manual, there's the form that you fill out, and of course there's no examinee form because there's no drawing tasks, and then the test plates which come on an easel. So some sample items from the TVPS3, we do have visual discrimination here, so here's a shape, find one the same. Visual memory, uh, I don't have a sample of that one, but obviously it's here's a shape. Now look at the next page and here's some, some shapes, find the one that was the same the one as the one you just saw. Spatial relationships, find the one that looks different or is the odd one out. And form constancy, as before, find the same shape even though it's been altered in some way. Um, in terms of size or orientation. We also have a sequential memory subtest, so not just visual memory but also sequential memory, finding the right order of the items, which some people think is, is linked to reading skills. And visual figure ground, again, finding the shape from within a background, and visual closure, as before, which shape would look the same if it was finished. So on the TVPS3 there's no basal, so you don't have to um, achieve a certain amount of items before you can begin scoring. However, there is a ceiling, so that's when either the child has got three items in a row incorrect, or obviously when you get to the end of the subtest and you've done all the items. So all it is as far as scoring is that you sum the scores for each subtest and then use the manual to convert them to scaled scores and percentile ranks for each subtest as well as a score for overall visual perception. And again, the TVPS3 gives you these kind of composites or indices, so we have a basic processes index, sequencing and complex processes. And apologies for the poor quality of the scan of this form. We don't actually don't sell the TVPS3, so I don't have a copy of it in my test library, so I had to get this image from Google. This is the clearest one I could find. So um, it's hard to see, but the basic processes index consists of the first ones that I showed, so the discrimination, visual memory, spatial relations, and form constancy. Then sequential memory is actually its own index, so there's no other scores that contribute to that, so just be mindful of that. And then the complex processes is the figure ground and visual closure, because they require a little bit more mental gymnastics, I guess, more of a, a working memory component to those as well. So clinical uses of this test, um, obviously again it's looking at visual perception and it's used in primary and secondary age children. The authors in the manual suggest that the test can be used for diagnostic and research purposes. I don't know that uh, many of us as OTs would use it for diagnostic purposes and it's probably, I wouldn't have thought the ideal tool for research because it is quite long, but I think the main reason people would use it is just if they want a more comprehensive test of visual perception because it does have subtests that aren't included in any of the other visual perception tests around. So if you want a really in-depth look at visual perception, this is probably the test that you would use. And the fact that there's no motor requirement, obviously if you do have a child with known motor deficits, then you're not going to have the issue of the subtests that have that motor component that that child will struggle with. So the strengths, obviously we have a variety of different kinds of visual perception tasks, so you not only from the, the score perspective, but qualitatively you can observe the child's ability to process that visual information when they're doing a, a number of different type of visual perceptual tasks. The fact that it has a higher age range than the DTP 
DTVP3 means that the TVPS is ideally used if you've got an older child. There is some nice background information about visual perception in the test manual, so it's always nice to have that information and that kind of resource there. Some of the weaknesses though are that sort of independent reviews of this test have questioned the validity of the individual subtests and I guess that's where it comes back to looking at the DTVP3 and some of those subtests that were actually removed because they weren't found to be reliable enough. Here we have more subtests but they aren't necessarily all, they don't necessarily have the levels of reliability and validity that we would like in a psychometric test and particularly the psychometric properties of the test are less stable at each end of the age range. So yes, talking about the end of the age range, so down towards the 4 and up towards the 18, 11 end of the age range, the psychometric properties are less stable than in the middle and there's a complete lack of psychometric inf information for the three indices, so that the indexes that the authors have lumped the questions into, there's no information about the psychometric properties of those, so you then wonder well, why, would, why would we have those indexes, but anyway, that's just how it is. So that's the TVPS3. Now looking at the Motor Free Visual Perception Test or the MVPT3. Again, this isn't a test that we actually sell and so apologies for the very blurry picture of the cover there. That's uh, all I was able to find on the internet. I'm, not, I'm, I'm including tests that we don't sell which is not normal for a webinar that, that we run but because there are just a few visual perception tests around, I thought it was probably useful to compare and contrast all of them and if you like the sound of the TBPS3 and the MVPT3 then it's pretty easy to find who actually sells those. So the MVPT3 published in 2003, so again it's getting quite old now um, and this is an overall test of visual perception so it doesn't give you the individual subtest scores that um, the first two tests we've looked at give you. The norms go from age 4 up to 94, so <laughs> much broader age range than the first two tests and we'll talk about why you might use it with an older person a bit later on. It's a bit quicker than the other tests so it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to administer and it's a revision of an older test called the MVPTR. Again standardised in America on a nice big sample of children and adults. So the components are the examiner's manual, the test plate's easel, so you see there's a lot of similarities between what the tests actually contain, the record form and then there's also a response time booklet. So the test is basically 65 items which are a mix of different kinds of visual perceptual challenges, so spatial relations, visual discrimination, figure ground, visual closure and visual memory items are all in there but they're not organised into discrete subtests of their own. Depending on how old you are will determine which items you do, so obviously if you're a child you will start at item 1 and if you're an adult you start at item 14. So children complete items 1 to 40, adults don't start until item 14 when they go through to the final item. So here are some sample items from the motor free visual perception test. We have as you can see some figure ground items and form constancy, visual closure and visual discrimination items. So to score the MVPT3 a single raw score is calculated based on the performance of all the different sub or items that the person has completed and then you get an overall standard score and a percentile rank. So with the MVPT3 you get a single raw score based on the items that the person completed which can be converted to a standard score and a percentile rank and you also get this optional response time index which just is supposed to give you an overall indication of the efficiency of visual processing and the scores can be classified as average, below average or extremely low, so we can't actually get an above average indication. Here's a sample of the record form, fairly straightforward, again we have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 for our overall score. So why would we use the MVPT3 in clinical practice? It's more of a screening tool, it's um, not going to give us very in-depth information about visual perception skills but if we just want to have a quick look at it in a child or an adult then the MVPT3 will give us that. If, it's, if you're going to use it with adults the, the clinical use of it is mainly in the stroke and brain injury population. Some clinicians do use it as part of an off-road driving battery, so um, driver trained OTs. Some people use the MVPT3 as part of their off-road um, testing. It is appropriate for clients with limited motor skills because 
as it is indicated in the title of the test, there's no motor component to it. And the fact that it's shorter may be a strength in terms of if you've got a child or a client with limited attention span who's not going to cope with a longer test, this is a way of giving you an overall look at their visual perception without having to take too long doing so. So strengths, as I just said, it's short and it's very easy to administer and score. The instructions are actually on the back of the test plates, so which, which comes on an easel, so it's pretty easy to use as the administrator. You don't have to spend a lot of time learning it. Uh, it has norms for adults, which is new compared to the other two tests that we looked at, and the reliability is better for clients aged over 11, so if that's your client group, you can be more confident in the psychometric properties for this test, which is good because we do have other options for the under 11s. As far as weaknesses, there is questionable reliability for children aged under 11, and there's also acknowledged multidimensionality. By multidimensionality, we mean that the test isn't necessarily just assessing the construct of visual perception, that there are other elements that will play a part in the child's performance or the person's performance on this test. There's also limited information in the manual about the test's validity, just talking about the weaknesses of the test, that there is questionable reliability for children under 11. We do, have, a, however, have other options for assessing children of that age. There is acknowledged multidimensionality, so I was saying that one of the difficulties with all visual perception tests is that for completing the tasks that are generally given as the visual perception tasks, there are usually other skills that are required as well as visual perceptual skills in order to succeed at the tasks. And so it's very difficult to tease out the visual perceptual component from the other components. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the webinar. The test provides limited information about validity and the psychometric data that is provided in the manual mainly relates to previous versions of the test. So it perhaps doesn't have the rigorous research in it that other tests that we've talked about today have. The last test that I wanted to talk about was the visual perceptual component of the Beery VMI. So this is um, obviously one subtest of a, a more comprehensive test. This is published in 2010, so it's also relatively recent, but um, also now getting on a bit, and it's looking purely at visual discrimination. So from that perspective, if we think about what I said before with the, the authors of the DTVP3, acknowledging that you need visual discrimination as a base skill in order to perform any other visual perceptual tasks, this is kind of looking to see whether that visual discrimination ability is in fact there. Um, so from that, I guess you can hypothesise that if a child is lacking in visual discrimination skills, that other visual perceptual skills will also be affected. The norms are down to age two and up to 99 years, 11 months. Again, using the test in an adult population is more likely to be when you have someone who's had some sort of incident like a stroke or a brain injury. The BMI is also used in some instances with people with a dementia. It only takes three minutes to administer the visual perception test, so it's a supplementary test of the VMI. Using the test in the older adult space, it can be used as a way of looking at dementia or identifying cognitive decline. That's the VMI as a whole. The visual perception test takes about three minutes and the test overall, the VMI was standardised on a very big sample of children and adults, again, in America. So the, um, the VMI itself, obviously most people know that this test, it's a sequence of geometric forms that looks at the integration of visual and motor abilities, and then the visual and motor tests are supplementary to that. The fact that it uses geometric forms means it's virtually culture free, and so the VMI uh, is a very popular test. It's very quick and it has a huge sample that it's been standardised on six times between 1964 and the current edition in 2010. So the visual perception test is designed to tease out the visual component from the visual and motor, and so it uses the same geometric forms as the copying test. The level of difficulty increases, both with the number of options that the person searches to find the correct answer and the nature of the differences in the shapes. They start off quite gross and then they end up um, a lot more subtle. So usually you administer the visual perception test following the 
the green form, the VMI, if you suspect visual perception difficulties. So this isn't really designed to be a standalone visual perception test. It's just a way of, I guess, digging a little bit deeper into visual perception skills once you've done a VMI and you've noticed that the person seems to be struggling a little bit with some of the visual aspects of those items on the green form. Here's an example of the form. So you can see it starts off very, very simple and it is a timed test, so these first items are teaching and practice items and then you start timing from when the person starts doing it independently. And then these are the more difficult items. You can see that the number of choices increases quite a lot between start and finish and the items get smaller and the difficulties get more, the differences get more difficult to, to find. So to score the visual perception test, you reach a ceiling or the person reaches a ceiling after they've failed three items in a row and you only score the items completed within the time limit, even if they have completed more after the time has passed or if they completed more after they reached their ceiling. Items below the basal are counted as passed, even though they weren't administered. Think back to the very first form, there are some items for the very young children, remembering this is norm down to two. Um, you wouldn't, I wouldn't tend to use this with a two-year-old, but if you are administering it with a, a child and you start with the item number four, the teaching and practice items, you give credit for the first three. So don't forget to do that, otherwise you'll skew your scoring and we get a standard score and a percentile rank. So as I said, usually used as part of the overall VMI assessment. You can choose to use this test if the child's or the person's performance with the shape copying tasks on the main VMI form suggest visual perception difficulty. So for example, if you notice that the child appeared to be unaware of the differences between what they drew and the original stimulus. So there's shapes, for example, where the, the shapes are supposed to be drawn touching each other and the child might draw them apart and might not be able to necessarily recognise the difference. Or from a spatial perspective, you see that they, the way that they've arranged the items is very, very different to the stimulus form and the child appears to be unaware of that. So it's, it's designed to delve a bit deeper, but it is still a screening of visual perception. I've just put there also that the VMI is often associated with handwriting. We also find, often find that we use the VMI when we have a referral about handwriting. And there is a little bit of research indicating the kind of the association of VMI scores and performance with handwriting. So if you feel that there's a visual perceptual element to the child's difficulties with handwriting, again, that might be something that you want to look into using this test. So strengths and weaknesses of the visual perception test. Strengths, obviously, it's quick and easy to administer has a very large age range and the fact that it's developmentally sequenced from least to most difficult means that it starts off easy, it's sort of not very intimidating and allows you to kind of start to see where that you the person has reached the upper limits of their ability. Weaknesses, obviously it only looks at visual discrimination but as I said before, we then kind of extrapolate from their score on here that if they've struggled with their visual discrimination, there's a good chance that other elements of their visual perceptual skills will also be affected. And if you wanted to then go on and do another visual perception test or use more functional observations of, of tasks that require visual perception, that would be a way of kind of delving into that a bit further. As with all of the tests that we've looked at today, this, the visual perception test and the VMI requires cognition as well as visual perception. Some people might argue that visual perception is actually a component of cognition. And the psychometrics for this particular subtest of the VMI are not as strong as the overall VMI. And obviously the, the overall VMI has very good validity and reliability. As with most tests, the subtests are not as strong, but they are still not too bad and compared to some of the other tests that we've looked at today, they are stronger. So I just want to talk a little bit more about multidimensionality because uh, I mentioned it before when I was talking about the motor free visual perception test. Something to really bear in mind, whichever visual perception test you decide to use, as I said, there are a number of factors that will impact upon a person's performance and you'll notice that there is a lot of similarities between the tasks that are used in all of the four tests that we've looked at. They all kind of show the person pictures and they have to find the right answer from among other answers. They all follow a very similar format. Having that format means that there are certain other skills that are required to complete the task that are not visual perceptual. So for example, visual attention. If the person can't attend for very long, 
or if they're not good at looking and scanning a whole page of information, then they're going to struggle. The ability to self-monitor and kind of check and make sure that they have definitely got the answer that they want. The ability to persevere when challenged, particularly in tests like the TVPS3, which is quite long and the tasks get more difficult as they go through. So their, their ability to attend over a longer period of time is involved there. Visual search and locate skills, um, the ability to process multiple visual images on the page, so looking at, at their ability to attend to one image when there's a lot of other stuff going on on the page. There's a huge working memory component to visual perception. Impulse control, so not just picking the first answer that looks like it's semi-correct. Processing speed, particularly when you've got tasks that are timed, like that VMI test that I've just talked about. And the ability to even just remember what they're supposed to do. I've had kids sort of halfway through a TVPS subtest and you think, I think they've actually forgotten what I've asked them to do. So if it drags on for a bit, it may be that they just forget the purpose of the task. So all of these factors could be contributing to the child's performance. And so it's really important with any test, but particularly with these visual perception tests, that as well as looking at the quantitative data that you get from the scores, that you're doing lots and lots of observations and qualitative stuff while the child is performing the test and writing lots of notes and watching what their eyes are doing. Are they scanning? Are they, do they have a systematic way of looking for the information? Do they seem like they are quite visually distracted? Uh, do you think their attention has played a factor? Are they very impulsive in general and do you think that they've really taken the time to consider their response? All of these things are going to impact on their score and all of these things need to be included when you're reporting on their performance because those are things that are going to go across not just a visual perception test but also uh, other daily living tasks. So I just wanted to give you some examples of that multidimensionality using these a couple of samples of the VMI visual perception test just to show you the way that you can kind of get extra information about the child's performance bearing in mind that there's other stuff to look at and not just the score. So this is a sample visual perception test from a five and a half year old whose VMI score, so the green form, the shape copying score was 79, so just a little bit below average and their visual perceptual score was 70, so that's, that's a full two standard deviations below the mean. So we can see that they've reached their ceiling basically at item 12 and if we look at what's happening here, so they've done quite okay on 7, 8 and 9 and item 10 is the first one where they have made an error and obviously they've picked the same size line but it's facing the wrong way and then we have again the same shape but it's obviously been rotated and the same shape but it's upside down. So we could start to think about perhaps looking at their visual spatial relationships and their ability to look at, at the spatial aspects of drawings or visual images. We can also look at the fact that they have been decided to choose the first option for all of these items from this one onwards. So something possibly happened about here where either they lost their focus or they lost interest in the task and they just decided to start picking the first one that looked vaguely right. So these are all things to be thinking about and as the examiner to be writing notes about. This is um, a four and a half year old whose VMI score was in the average range at 96, but the visual perception score was slightly below the average range at 80. So if we have a look there, it's not clear exactly where the ticks and crosses are, so we'll have a look at the items one by one. So items seven and eight and nine were all correct. 10 was correct and 11 was where we started to have our errors. So we can see the item is just slightly different. Item 12, it's upside down and item 13, it's the right shape but it's a bit smaller. And I think the interesting thing here is if you look at where the error started to come in, this is a, a child again whose visual motor score is, is within the average range. The error started to come in when we suddenly had an extra item to search. So we've gone from having three different options for them to consider to now having four. So one of the things I would be hypothesizing is that this is kind of where they reach their difficulty level or the upper level of ability of being able to juggle 
different bits of visual information at once. So maybe they're okay when they only have to look at three, but once they start to have four, that's where it starts to get difficult for them and they start making errors. Again, you would need to see the child to be able to know if that's a, a good hypothesis or not, but looking at these, I'm just, I guess, trying to give the example of looking at the data to find extra qualitative elements in it and not just the score. And I guess that's one of the the upsides of this multi-dimensionality of visual perception tests is that if you know what else you're looking for, it the, the tasks on visual perception tests do give you the opportunity to observe, for example, how the child processes multiple forms of information at once and to give then maybe feedback to the teacher that if you're giving them a worksheet or something to do, don't give them more than about three bits of information to work with at a time because after that they start to have difficulty. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. I'm very sorry about the technical glitches that we've had. I'm just going to go to the questions panel now and see if we have questions from anyone who's in the audience. And I can see there's a question here, or well, someone's raised their hand, but no question attached to that. So I'll just give you a moment if you do have any questions to type in. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming through. Yep, not seeing any questions coming through. So I think we'll wind that up now. Thank you for bearing with me with these technical issues. And please do remember to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar and let me know if there are any other topics that you'd like to have a presentation on. Otherwise, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you at the next.